Well, this is great. Well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to have me uh, have me share a little bit of uh, of Cisco's story with you, and also some of our experiences um, that that hopefully you can relate to. Um, my name is uh, Roland Plett. As uh, as was mentioned earlier, I'm an uh, so I'm a solutions architect with Cisco Systems uh, in the mining um, in the mining vertical uh, or industry. And uh, and so uh, I'm hoping that uh, some of my experiences um, will will help you in in your uh, deliberation of how to how to process the, the whole topic of cybersecurity. Um, I, I want to start with an assumption this morning, first of all. Um, and, and we don't always start our cyber discussion with this assumption. Uh, I want you to assume for, for a minute here that in your, uh, in your career at your mining company, that you will be compromised at some point in the cybersecurity realm, that, uh, that your systems will, uh, will see an attack. And, and I think that's helpful because it, it helps to, uh, uh, it helps to prepare you, just as Tony was talking about in the safety safety share. Uh, it, it, it's important to be prepared, and I think that's a really good, uh, really good posture to come at this discussion with. What I'm told by people who have been compromised is that we could have responded faster if we had visibility to what unusual behavior had been happening. And I think uh, I think we sometimes forget that the um, the machines and uh, and control systems uh, that we have operating in in our site, um, they don't have the same endpoint protections that that maybe the IT teams, uh, security teams are used to. Uh, that that really the um, the protection that we have on the on the machine side of of the business um, is more about behavior, and so if you can't see the behavior, it's it's almost impossible to protect yourself. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today is how do you know um, what's happening in your mind? How do you know who's talking in your mind? Um, what I'm gonna go through today is, um, is a, few, uh, a few things here. Uh, I've organized it in the following fashion. With the, with the explosion of devices connected to your communications infrastructure, um, do you really know who's talking to who? Um, the other thing that's happened is that, that, that applications are, are now distributed everywhere, right? In the age of cloud and edge compute, it becomes more difficult to know where all your application components are and where they live. So then with all this added complexity, how do you secure this complex infrastructure? What I'm going to do um, towards the end of my talk here is to share a tool that Cisco has that we use to actually get that visibility of your infrastructure. And, uh, and this isn't a, an advertisement for, for Cisco necessarily, but I wanted to share an example of what this looks like to be able to see into your infrastructure and how to integrate that into your other security tools. And uh, so I wanna talk through that example today and, uh, and, and you, hopefully you can apply it to your infrastructure. And I, I'd be glad to, to talk about specifics with you um, at, the, at the end or, or on a future date. So here's a, a quick picture of some of the things that are talking on your mind network. It was only a few years ago that the only communication in your mining environment were control systems, safety systems, maybe push to talk systems, maybe a few others, but that was pretty much it. Uh, today, there's a lot more systems. I have one customer that actually hands out badges that talk on the network at the security kiosk. So when you check in in the morning um, or whatever time of day you check in, uh, you get this badge and it talks to the Wi-Fi network to identify where you are on the site. Um, it senses gas levels um, of where you are to, keep, to, to ensure that you're in a safe environment. It has a panic button on it uh, so that you can signal if you're in distress. Um, and it also has a detector in it that identifies if you all of a sudden um, lay down and aren't getting up, uh, it will actually signal an alarm. All of a sudden, quite a bit different than just a couple of systems. Now that's one of the systems that's been added to the, added to the environment. I have another mining customer um, that collects hundreds of data points from their haul trucks and, 
every few minutes. Um, and this is their own system. It's not the one that comes from the OEM. And they analyze these data points for predictive maintenance, safety concerns, or other business relevant trends. And so these are a couple of examples of some of the newer things that are, have started to come up in, in mine environments. Um, in a lot of cases, the communication infrastructure has become critical uh, to achieving efficient production numbers. So lots of things talking on the infrastructure. The other thing that's changed in recent years is that applications um, are starting to live in a lot of different places. Only a few years ago, all applications either lived on a computer rack in the mine or in a corporate data center. Today, um, I have a resource customer who uses a video calling service similar to this, uh, this Zoom call that we're on uh, that, that lives in the cloud, just like this Zoom call. They connect their field operation to head office and, uh, and it cuts down significantly on windshield time and field visits. Um, with the video technology that we have today, especially some of the endpoints that we make uh, from Cisco, um, you're actually able to see um, see very clearly uh, what the expressions are of people. You can see the equipment that people are working on. And a lot of these applications live in the cloud. So obviously they can't coexist with control systems that are air gapped, but they still live in your mine environment and can live in your, uh, in your infrastructure. So you need to be aware of them from a cybersecurity perspective. A few minutes ago, I told you about a customer that logs data in a haul truck. This is done by a hardened server that's bolted to the truck frame right behind the driver's seat. That's what I call edge compute. So application components are living everywhere all, and all these locations need to be secured with your cyber strategy. So let's talk a little bit about security because that's why we're here, right? When control systems were, um, were first connected to communications networks that are similar to the IT networks that we, we have been seeing for a while, then the automation world adopted a, secu a security model that we call uh, Purdue. And I know most of you are familiar with this model. It puts assets into zones based on their function and their functional group. Uh, for instance, a conveyor system may have its own cell or zone uh, that is firewalled from other cells or zones. This has been dis uh, disrupted in a few ways in, in recent years and operating teams have had difficulty enforcing this Purdue model um, while leveraging new efficiencies that have come along uh, from various providers. As cloud-based systems, uh, and we're even seeing control systems from the cloud or remote operation centers, as these become more popular, it becomes necessary to extend zones that normally just lived on site to offsite locations. Um, these offsite systems need to remain segmented from other zones to maintain that Purdue model. And so what I've recommended uh, as I show here in the cloud ICS portion, um, that if you're gonna go off site, especially into the cloud, you definitely need to firewall and IDMZ um, those environments until you're absolutely sure that you can, you can guarantee that they are segmented and, and zoned off from each other. So just an extra precaution there. Another, um, another uh, model that I've seen become fairly popular is, um, is because there's more pressure to actually connect things at level zero or level one to some outside environment, um, or I should say that normally would live in level zero or level one to an outside environment. Of course, if you're gonna con conform to Purdue, that would mean that you would have to communicate through all of these other zones to get to the internet. So what people have started to do is adopt a bit of a different model that's completely separate from their control system model. And I've called that the, uh, the industrial IOT uh, approach. Um, I, I talked to someone yesterday who calls it their manufacturer zone uh, approach. But the idea is that, uh, that if you have, a, a, say, a vibration sensor that you put onto uh, a rotating asset in your, in your mine site, and you want it to, to actually send data to uh, an analytics engine in the cloud, um, you could actually completely separate that off and have it come through a completely separate security zone that goes directly into the cloud. Uh, the reason why um, I've heard it called a manufacturing zone, uh, the manufacturer zone is that a lot of manufacturers actually want direct access to the management or ma maintenance port on their piece of equipment. 
And so this is also a way that you can accomplish that without it, it actually touching any of your control systems, you can actually have this separate zone come from the maintenance port directly to your manufacturer. So as you start to apply some of these uh, architectures and, and models, um, it can get pretty complicated pretty quickly, especially with all the new systems and all the different locations that your applications live. And so uh, there's a couple of tools that I'll, I'll put out there for you and then we'll get into, um, into the, the demonstration. There's a large number of new security considerations and as technology uh, connects more assets and services together, one way that I've seen customers get a handle on their site cybersecurity is the SAFE methodology that we use at Cisco. It follows a transaction or service interaction from the originator or user all the way through to the end systems that are needed to fulfill the request. SAFE maps out a full path of all the security measures in place along the way. Uh, and, and, and that gives you a really clear picture of, of what it, where your strengths and gaps are along that uh, transaction path. Doing this with a number of services or transactions can be overwhelming. Um, so we've also come up with a different approach. But this, if you wanna really scrub a specific transaction or process in your mind and wanna make sure that this is really, you know, that this is secure and have a good picture of what the security posture is, you can actually take, follow that transaction through your infrastructure and just identify where your um, security strengths and gaps are. If this is too much for you and, and you want a more broad, a general approach, what we've done is actually come up with, uh, with stages. This table maps out four stages and I'm not gonna go through them in detail. I'll have this uh, for your reference, but it helps uh, the mining operation to set a baseline of security. And then as the baseline matures, you can actually go to stage one, stage two, stage three. And that, that really helps you to focus on the things that are most important, right? I, I've, I've talked to customers who, are, who, who got a presentation about the latest tool, maybe similar to what I'm gonna be showing you here. And, uh, and, and they decide that this is exactly what they need to invest in. And, and when you chat with them a little bit more, you realize that, that they haven't really even done the basic zoning or segmentation um, policy yet. And that's really a, a sort of a baseline component. And so this helps you to map that out in various stages. What I'd like to do now is actually turn our attention to a, a specific, um, specific tool. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump into the, the demo here pretty quickly. Um, but first of all, I'll give you a bit of context. Uh, typically, um, a security infrastructure has quite a lot of tools in it. And anyone who's been involved in IT security um, probably isn't surprised by the statistic that, that, that there's, there can be you know, north of 30 or 40 security tools in play in a, in a security infrastructure. Um, OT is definitely not that crowded with OT tools yet. Um, and, uh, and yet it, it is important that you talk to the rest of the security tools in the organization so that the security operations center uh, for your company can, uh, can, can actually have a, a full view of what's going on. Um, and what I'm gonna show you today is a visibility tool that actually does integrate into other tools, not just Cisco, other Cisco tools, but, but other tools in the industry. And, uh, and, and actually give, leverages a lot of the information that, that this tool discovers into access control and firewalls and, and other uh, policy engines as well, okay? Uh, the way the tool works is, uh, is that it, it has sensors throughout the infrastructure. So in a mine environment, it would have sensors built into say the switches that you have uh, at your various levels of the mine and various locations. It has, uh, it, it has sensors built into wireless access points and routing uh, um, gateways and, uh, and a number of other network infrastructure components. And so you don't have to invest in separate capture devices. Um, the, the sensors are built right into the infrastructure. They then send metadata or flow data up into a central uh, AI engine um, which we call the CyberVision Center. 
And that's what I'm going to show you today is the dashboard of, of what it actually does with all that compiled information. This gives you also a view of some of the other systems that we talked to beyond the ones I had in the previous diagram. Um, and you probably recognize some of these systems from your own environment. I'm just going to hop over um, to the demo now uh, to give you a little bit of an idea. There we go. Just to make sure that this is updating properly. There we go. So I want to take you back about a year um, in, in your mind. And uh, let's call it uh, just because of the way that, that the data is. This is from our, our uh, demo environment. And so it's, it's data that we captured about a year ago um, and gives us a bit of an idea of how, how the data is processed within the platform. And so I'll just set the stage for you here. It's August 14th, 2019. And you've just installed CyberVision in your My Network the day before. Today is the first day you're able to see the conversations that happen in your mind. Since it was installed, CyberVision has been listening on each of your network devices and, and taking note of all the conversations that are taking place. The information that you see on the screen here was automatically compiled from what you heard on your network. For today, we're going to focus on three numbers on this first dashboard. First, let's look at this number 237. This is the number of uh, conversations that have happened in the last 24 hours. We call them activities here, but you can think of them as conversations between two different endpoints. The number 108 uh, over on the left uh, is in the components box. That's the number of devices that it's seen on the network, okay? There's one other number that I want you to notice, and that's this 183. Um, this is how many security vulnerabilities CyberVision has already identified. Just in the last 24 hours, um, it's identified 183 vulnerabilities, and I'll tell you a little bit about how it does that. As we go through, just remember that all of this information has been deduced or inferred from the conversations that it's been listening to. It hasn't actually queried any infrastructure. It hasn't sent any requests to any infrastructure. It's just listened to the communication that's on the infrastructure and actually taken the information from that, those conversations and compiled um, all of this information from that, okay? Let's take one step deeper into the information here um, with another more detailed dashboard. Um, the way CyberVision organizes the information, uh, it, it lets you filter uh, the data in, in a couple of different ways. Um, each of these squares on this page is a different subset of the data based on preset filters. Most of these presets are generated by the system out of the box based on your operational role. Um, but I've created three custom views here on the top that we're going to be walking through today. Let's, uh, let's start with this first one here. Okay. When CyberVision discovers a new conversation or a new conversation participant, it assigns a number of tags to each, uh, to each conversation and, and each participant. And you can see the tags um, down here, uh, and they're, they're categorized by, um, by activities that it's seen uh, in the conversations and also by the components that it's seen. Um, you'll notice that each of these tags uh, can be filtered on if you want more information. And, uh, and, and those filters are over on the left-hand side, and we'll see how that works here in a second. Let's say you wanted to focus on, um, say you want to, you're interested in a specific activity, say this program upload activity. So you want to know who's been programming your network in the last 24 hours. You can actually filter on that programming, uh, on that program upload tag, which is under control system behavior. So let's, let's just do that here. We'll open up the control system behavior options and we'll scroll down the program upload and we'll click on this. And what happens is that it actually filters down all of the data that we've been uh, looking at down to three components and the conversations that happened with those three components. At this point, you're probably interested in, okay, well, let's get a little bit more information about how these three components have talked to each other. And, uh, and I'm gonna have to rearrange my desktop here a little bit. 
There we go. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's actually change the view here to the map expert view. And uh, this obviously changes, um, changes the, the, the look of, of the dashboard a little bit um, so that you can actually visually see the three components um, that we've filtered down to. And these three components are the ones that are in, involved in the upload conversation. Now, if, if you're familiar with this upload activity, um, you can probably already guess what's been happening here. We've got a workstation here <clears throat> and we have two PLCs and the workstation has been talking to the PLCs. That's what these lines mean. Um, now, if you're interested in what that conversation was, you can actually click on the line and you actually get an information panel on the right hand side here. Um, and, and this gives you some information. It gives you some of the tags associated with that conversation. You can also click on this technical sheet, and I'm going to do that in a second here, that opens up into a whole page of a lot more detail about that conversation. Um, the other thing you'll notice is this little red circle kind of jumps out at you with a number inside. That's actually how many vulnerabilities have been identified for this specific device. If you click on the device, you'll notice that the, 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 the detail page on the right hand side here changes to a device or component detail page. This has a little bit more information on it and, and I'll, uh, I'll actually dive into this a little bit more. Let's click on the technical sheet. What that does is opens up a new little window across the front and the first tab that it opens up to actually identifies a whole bunch of metadata about this device. Now let's think about this for a second. Again, all of this information has been inferred by the conversations that CyberVision has been listening to. So just the packets that have been flowing back and forth between these machines, it's been listening to that and it, it's able to identify the vendor name, uh, firmware version, model number, serial number, all of this information comes from the conversations going back and forth between the machines without querying or sending any requests to the machines. Super powerful information. And I'll show you how we use that in a minute. But one of the really important uses that it has is, uh, is being able to reference this to publicly available databases. So, so what, what this tool does is it takes that model reference and it actually looks up all the security vulnerabilities that are associated with that software release and firmware release and hardware release number. And it lists them off for you conveniently in the second security tab. Now, not all security risks are the same. And, uh, and so it actually identifies the CVSS score on the right hand side, which is a fairly well known score in the security community. Uh, a 7.8 here is a pretty serious uh, score and you probably want to look into that vulnerability and, and get it patched as soon as you can actually schedule some, uh, some uh, maintenance window to do that, right? The, this one down here is scored at a zero and you probably don't need to pay a lot of attention to it. Um, it it's more there for your information, okay? But it doesn't really demand a whole lot of action. Um, let's, uh, let's actually try something here. I'm going to close this window out. And, um, and what I'm going to do is we're in this expert map view. Let me just uncheck this filter and let's see what happens. Okay, so this is interesting. Now you get a view of all of the, um, all of the devices that it's discovered. Okay. This gives you um, a really kind of interesting map of all the devices in your infrastructure and all of the conversations that have happened are happening between all of the infrastructure. Now, I, I keep saying, well, the last 24 hours, that's when this data set was actually created, was in a 24 hour period. Um, you can actually identify any, uh, any historical time period up here uh, that you want to look at and, and you can see what conversations happened during that time period. Same as we did before, you can click on a conversation here and it opens up a tab on the right hand side. Um, you can click on a specific device and it opens up that device information. You could go to the technical sheet and it would give you the vulnerabilities and all of that that we just talked about, okay? The other thing you'll notice in here is, uh, is that you've got, we've got a blue box around some of these devices. Now what I've done is I've actually grouped some of these devices together 
um, into a functional group because this all kind of looks like a big mis mishmash of things um, if, if, at the first when you look at it. And it takes a little bit to make sense of it. One way that you can make sense of it is to actually group some of this together. And what I've done here is, is I've actually uh, grouped together some devices that are part of a chemical process um, at a, a, a location that called Pearson Lake. And, uh, and as you group these things together, you can actually use those group names to define that filter I talked about earlier, right? So if we go back to the, um, to the explore page and, and I just have to assure that I actually want to go back there. Um, and you saw these presets that I did, you can notice that I've actually set up two presets here that are specific to groups of uh, components that I've, I, I've identified uh, um, as chemical, this chemical process grouping that I just referenced. So if I click on this um, sort of more filtered preset, uh, it actually brings up that specific subset of data uh, right to my screen. And you'll, know, you'll actually recognize this layout as being the same as that subsection of the, of the total uh, grouping of, of infrastructure. Now, um, you'll notice that there's names in this infrastructure uh, for the various devices. And these are names that you've given uh, to your devices. Some people are better at giving names than other people. Um, but a lot of times, the most useful names actually identify um, the function that this device is providing, um, where it's located, uh, maybe what version it's at. There's a few different ways that you can name your infrastructure. But um, this actually uh, is super helpful in terms of the metadata that's shared with other security devices, okay? The names of endpoints can be referenced when you're in other, in other applications because CyberVision associates recognizable names with the network addresses or, or, or some other um, data that's, that's readily available on the infrastructure. And so that can be shared with other applications and that association can be made so that when you as an operator or someone in the security operations center sees that device in their, in their reports, it actually has an intelligent name beside it rather than just an IP address or a MAC address or some kind of other identifier um, that's difficult to associate with. The other thing that's kind of nice is the metadata will actually give you the ability to group functions together in your other tools, right? So as that metadata is shared with your policy engine, for instance, you can actually make a policy um, that says, say that you don't want any drives um, uh, in, in your uh, site uh, or motors in your site to be able to talk to an HMI directly, right? It, you want it to talk through a control system. If you make that policy, you can actually do it in that general terms and then if somebody adds an HMI or adds a drive to the infrastructure at any point, you don't have to add that to your policy or go and change all your policies. Your policy automatically includes that, uh, that new piece of equipment because you're, you've made the policy based on these groupings and the group information that comes from this tool. I could show you a lot of other things, but I, I know that, that there, there's other um, information that we want to go through this morning. And so I'm going to leave it at that, but absolutely reach out to me if you're interested in this kind of a tool and, and, uh, and, and how it could map into your infrastructure specifically, um, whether it's Cisco or not. Um, I'm going to just wrap up with a couple of things, right? So today um, we talked about how visibility really matters, especially in the operations environment uh, where there's a lot of machine to machine traffic, the endpoint protection just isn't uh, there the way it would be in an IT environment. So you need to see the behavior of what's happening in your infrastructure. The other thing that I wanna leave with you is, is that integration matters. It really, it really simplifies the effectiveness of your whole security um, solution when you can share information between the different security platforms and security applications and it, and it creates a, a consistency across all of your different views um, that, that help you to, to not make mistakes, okay? Um, and, and, and as a reference, what I've done is I've left you with this URL here at the end, uh, just to give you a better idea of what Cisco does in the mining, uh, in the mining world. Uh, there's some examples there of companies we've worked with um, that have, have seen some really good uh, efficiency gains 
with Cisco infrastructure um, and, uh, and some examples of, of uh, new safety approaches um, that have really uh, improved the experience. 